Hello! Today we're going to look at a branch of mathematics which has been very influential in theoretical computer science in particular because it helps suggest to us what things are useful to prove about our programs and other structures. And this is called category theory, uh, which is a theory of structure, you might say. Uh, so the main insight is that we should not consider things in isolation, whatever these things are, but we should also consider how they relate to each other. And this is how, how the structure arises, uh, which leads to the idea of category theory that not only should you consider the objects that you want to study, whatever these are, but you should also consider so-called arrows or homomorphisms between these objects. Uh, so the way we, we usually uh, picture this is we call this a category, which is meant to be a word that means almost anything. So almost anything can be a category. Uh, so we usually picture this as a kind of uh, some kind of blob like this. So this is our category. And then inside uh, this blob, uh, we have our objects of study. Uh, so it could be something like this, some, some objects. And then we consider that there are some arrows between these objects. So it could be an arrow from this one, from this one to that one, or maybe one from this one to itself, etc. Right. Um, so formally, we define a category to have a set of objects. So these are these, um, these things here, and this one as well. Uh, and then for any two objects, we have a set of morphisms between them. So we usually call these things morphisms or arrows or homomorphisms. And they are these objects here, right? Where they draw like an arrow. And uh, they can go from one object to itself or from one object to another one. And it doesn't have to be only one between any two. You could also have parallel arrows like this. And, and that's very common, right? Um, so if all this was all we had, then we couldn't really say much about these structures, right? Because it's just a set of data, but there are no laws that, that tells us anything about this. So we need to add for a little bit more structure for this to be useful. So the first thing we ask for is that for any object A, there should be an identity morphism from A to itself. So something like this. Right? So in fact, at each object here, we have a little identity on that object. Uh, so this, in some sense, is that every object is related to itself, right? Uh, so it doesn't have to be this one. It can be many arrows from A to A. And the second thing we ask for is that if I have an uh, amorphism F from A to B, so let's say that here is my A, here is my B, and here is my F, uh, and I have a G from B to C, so here is my G, uh, then I should be able to compose these two morphisms in order to get one morphism directly from A to C. So we write this either as first F followed by G, or sometimes we write it as G composed with F in the different order. Uh, because if we think of these things as functions, then we apply this one first and then we apply that one. Right. Uh, and usually we write application from the right. Um, okay, uh, so we need to have these identities, we need to have composition, and we need to have some laws for this to actually be useful. So the first law says that if you take a morphism f like this, and then you compose with the identity, uh, then that should be the same thing as just doing f. And similarly, in the other way, if you first do an identity and then do f, that should be the uh, g, that should be the same thing as just doing g. Right? So composing with the identity does nothing, it really is the identity. And the second law here says that it doesn't matter how you bracket your compositions. If you take f and then you compose that with what you get if you compose g and h, that should be the same thing as if you first compose f and g and then you compose that with h. Right? So it doesn't matter in which order you do the compositions. Um, but of course, these things have to line up so that they actually compose. Okay, 
Uh, so let's look at an example. Uh, so this is in some sense a very common motivating example, which is the category of sets and functions, right? So here the objects are sets. So this is a common theme. So we often name the category after the objects of it. So I'm calling this category set because the objects here are sets. So for every set, you get an object in this category, right? So we have lots and lots of objects. So here you have the natural numbers is a set and the unit type is a set and natural numbers, arrow natural numbers is a set, etc., etc. right? Um, so these are the objects and the morphisms from one set to another set are exactly given by the functions from A to B. So here we are saying that the morphisms really are functions. Uh, so a morphism, an arrow here is just a function from the natural numbers to the unit, uh, unit set to unit type. Okay, and then the identity function uh, is the identity morphism. So it's the function that given an x and a returns the x. Right. And composition similarly is just given by composition. So let's see if we can do this together. Uh, so we have f from a to b and we have g from b to c and we have to produce a function from a to c, right? So we get given an x and a and we have to produce something in c, okay? But uh, g will give us something in c if only we give it something in b, right? Uh, so here we have to give something in B. Um, but F will give us something in B if only we give it something in A. Right. But we do have something in A. So we can give that here. And then we see that this is just the ordinary function composition of F and G. Right. Uh, and then you can easily prove that D satisfies the laws, so if you compose with identity, you get the same thing, and it doesn't matter in which order you do the composition. Um, so we can also do this in Agda, where here I've defined what it means to be a category. And for size reasons, so I don't want to bother about set one versus set zero, etc. Sometimes I want my objects to be a large set, sometimes I want them to be a small set. So I've turned on type in type in in this file, which means that set is in set, which strictly speaking makes logic inconsistent, but in, for practical reasons is quite quite convenient. Uh, so this means I don't have to worry about different sizes of, of sets here. Uh, okay, so defining a category to be this given by this record, where I have a set of objects, and for any two objects, I get a set of homomorphisms. And then suggestively, I'm also going to define arrow as a synonym for hom, so that I can say that here id for every a is an arrow from a to a. And composition, if I have something from a to b and something from b to c, then I get something from a to c. Right. And then here I'm defining the other notation for composition as the going the other way. So then you might be used to from uh, from sets. Uh, and then here I have the laws. So first I have associativity. Doesn't matter which way I bracket this. And the two laws that says that identity really is an identity on the left and on the right. right. So id composed with f is f and f composed with id is f. And here is the example of the category of sets and functions. I'm saying that the objects are sets, the morphisms are functions, the identity is the identity and composition is function composition. Right. We have used these two definitions from the standard library, the function file. So you can look this up if you want. So here's the identity and here is composition, right. uh, which is defined in terms of, of a dependent version of composition. But that's not so important for us. And you see that the proofs of associativity and identities are particularly simple because this is just reflect uh, raffle.